you got T tax was manageable. It was manageable. Now we're going to do ANOVA, which is a little bit crazy in terms of the number of calculations you have to do. But if you stay organized, you will be fine. If you follow the steps, you'll do great. Keep everything neat and tidy to be in good shape. But once you start letting things drop, or if you forget to do things, or don't keep things in order, it can get pretty confusing pretty quick. What we're going to do today is walk through ANOVA, or Analysis of Variance, which is a kind of statistical analysis or comparing means when you have an independent variable with more than two conditions. So as you can see, the simple problem we're going to work through today, we have three conditions. The idea is that we've got a psychological researcher who's been asked by a private mental hospital to determine whether or not a patient's diagnosis is an influence on how long they stay in the hospital. It doesn't matter. There's a significant difference in how long different groups of patients stay in the hospital depending on their diagnosis. And the researchers are going to look at three groups of patients. But that's the minimum number we can look at and do with NOVA. We're going to look at people with affective disorders, cognitive disorders, and drug-related conditions. So the three different categories of disorder, and the researcher gathers data from the five most recent patients to check out in terms of how long each of those patients stayed in the hospital. Okay, the five most recent patients with each diagnosis and takes that data and then performs some basic descriptive calculations. You should know at this point how to get every single one of these values. You should know how to get n, degrees of freedom, mean, sum of squares, and sample variance for a given sample. You should be able to do that initially. So I'm not going to go through and calculate those things again. I'm just going to give you those statistics because we have plenty of other things to calculate. Now what I recommend for you to do today is work through, write the correct answers on the worksheet as we go along, do all of the math on separate paper, and label everything really clearly. Don't cram formulas and math into the sides of this document. Because this is going to be your one complete problem we're going to do in class from beginning to end for this independent groups. Next time, we're going to do a totally different problem for related groups. Next Tuesday, in class, we're going to talk about the next article which is a research study that uses a design that requires ANOVA. We're going to talk about the article in class. In lab, we're going to go over the problem set for analysis of variance. And your exam for one-way analysis of variance is not this Thursday, but next Thursday. You basically have three class periods before you're getting tested on this. I'm totally serious. So do not miss class between now and next Thursday. Okay, no kidding. Don't miss class. We've got a lot of stuff to do between now and next Thursday. Now, as I said, it's easy to do if you stay on top of it. But if you let things go, put things off, you're going to get behind. So we're going to go through and do this whole worksheet today. That will give you one whole problem that you can look at with all the work for independent samples, and then you can use that as your model for working on the problem set and doing other practice problems. So write everything out, make sure everything is very clear, and if at any point you don't understand what we're doing, you don't understand where a number came from, or you need me to back up and explain something, say so. Okay? Because if you get behind, it's going to be a cascade of crazy. Okay? So make sure you know how we got where we are before we move on to the next thing. And don't be shy. It's OK. So first thing we're going to do now, now that we've got our basic data, everybody's got their hand up, right? First thing we 
got, first thing we're going to do is F max. Okay. You will see on this worksheet, you've got lots of boxes. This is what the test is going to look like. Lots of boxes. Your job is to put the right numbers in the right boxes. And show me all the work for each one of those calculations. So first thing I'm going to have you do, because you already know how to do this one, is F max. I want you to go ahead and calculate F max observed, figure out F max critical, and I'll give you two or three minutes to fill in all those boxes, and I'm going to ask you what the right answer is. largest or save the largest sample variance. 3.5. Right? How do you know that? Because you just look up here for the different sample variances and you see whichever one is the biggest and you put that one in the box. What goes down here in smallest sample variance? 2.5, because that's the smallest one up there. So put that one in the box. Then how do you calculate F max observed? You divide them. You divide them how? Largest over smallest, right? So then you divide this by this, the largest by the smallest, and what do you get? 1.4. 1. 1. 4. Okay. That's our F max observed. What's our K? Three. Three. It's the number of conditions, right? Or number of treatments. What's our alpha level? 0. 0.05. 0. 0.05. We don't have any other information, so we assume 0. 0.05 is the right answer. What is our DF common, our common degrees of freedom? Four. They all have degrees of freedom four. That's a requirement for F max, right? You have to have samples of the same size to do F max. Otherwise, you have to do a different test for homogeneity variance. And so, if I use that information, what is my F max critical? Hmm? I have a vote for 15.5. I see some nodding. Yeah? Mm -hmm. One more. Yes. Okay. 15.5. All right. So our F max observed was 1.4. Our F max critical is 15.5. Are we going to retain or reject the null hypothesis? Retain? How about that's a question. I asked you a question, you're giving me an answer. <laughs> Retain. There we go. Downward intonation. It's a good thing. And you say, retain? It's like, I don't know. But you should know. You know, imagine it's a test. And you have to know because you're going to get points from there. Yes, retain. We're going to retain the null hypothesis. What does that mean? When we retain the null hypothesis for F max. That's right. We have homogeneity of variance. And our samples are similar enough to compare. So we can proceed with our analysis. Okay, good. So we can go on with our analysis to test whether we're going
going to retain or reject the null hypothesis in this case. What is the null hypothesis for this study? There is no difference in length of stay. Okay, so there is no difference in the length of stay depending on the patient's diagnosis, right? More specifically, there is no difference in the length of stay depending on whether a patient has an affective disorder, cognitive disorder, or drug-related condition. Okay, because we have to say what groups we're comparing, which means in your statement you need to include all of the conditions. You have to lay it out. You can't just say depending on the patient's diagnosis, because I don't know what the diagnoses are that you're considering. So if I ask you to give me the null hypothesis, make sure you include all the groups. What groups you're comparing, what you're comparing about them, whether you're talking about significance, and if you are, any direction of the effect. All right, so that's our null hypothesis. What's our alternate hypothesis? That there will be a significant difference in the length of stay, depending on whether the patient has, there you go, depending on whether the patient has an affective disorder, a cognitive disorder, or a drug-related condition. All right, now, here's the thing about ANOVA. Once we've gone up to having more than two levels to our IV, we don't know what's different, right? It's not, once you find a significant difference with the analysis of variance, all you know is that there's some difference in here. That could mean that one of the conditions is different from the other two. It could also mean that they're all different from each other. You don't know. All the ANOVA will tell us is whether or not there's at least one condition among the ones we're looking at that's significantly different from the others. I didn't mean to do that. That's okay. It's all right. Okay, so we're going to do that test and see if we get, if we find evidence for there being some significant difference among these three conditions. If we do find that there's a significant difference, then we have to do another test. It's called a post hoc test. And that test is done to tell us what specifically is different. And we only do the post hoc test if we get a significant result for the ANOVA. Okay, if we don't get a significant result for the ANOVA, then we stop. But as you might imagine, since we're trying to give you a complete problem that has all the parts, we're going to get significance. The question is, what's it going to be? Then we'll do the post hoc test, and we'll calculate effect size, and then we'll do the summary like we normally do in sentences and then APA style. All right. So we've got two hypotheses. The null hypothesis is there will be no difference in length of stay for patients depending on whether they have an affective disorder, a cognitive disorder, or a drug-related condition. Our alternate hypothesis is there will be a difference between those three groups in terms of length of stay. To begin our analysis, to begin our ANOVA, we're going to start by calculating some additional statistics for each condition. The first one we're going to calculate, the new statistic, which is actually just a new name for an old statistic, is Big T. Big T stands for total, and Big T is the same as sum of X. It's a total. And it's a total for a given condition. So to get the T value, the Big T value, for affective disorders, what you're going to do is go up and look at the data for the affective disorders group, and you're going to add up the scores for the five patients in that condition. So just look at the top of the page, and you'll see that the affective disorders group has the following scores. 7, 6, 5, 
four, and eight. Meaning that patient one stayed seven weeks, patient two stayed six weeks, patient five stayed five, three stayed five weeks, patient four stayed four weeks, and patient five stayed eight weeks. So that's what those numbers are. So just add those numbers up. And what do you get? 30. 30. Okay. What I'd like you to do is write that number in the box. Now, big T squared. Nothing magic here. All we're going to do is take the T value we just calculated and square it. So take 30 times 30. What do you get? 900. Right, next one. T squared over N. You're going to take the T squared value you just calculated and you're going to divide it by the sample size for that condition. Okay, and that was? Five. Five. So you're going to take 900 divided by 5. 1 8. Okay. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky. The last one here says sum of x squared. And you can't tell from looking at this notation whether we're talking about the sum of all the x squareds or the sum of x squared, right? You can't tell from looking at that notation. However, if you think about it, we already have a value up here that means the same thing as, the, as this sum of x and then squared. What is that? Sum of x squared. That's the same thing as this one right here is t squared. Okay, That's t squared. And that's why we use different notation here than just writing sum of x, because we actually need to keep these two notations straight. So when we're talking about sum of x squared on this worksheet, when we're doing analysis of variance. Sum of x squared in this case means the sum of the squared x values. So what you need to do now is go back up and look at that data again, and you need to square each one of those values for the subjects. So you need to do 7 times 7, 6 times 6, 5 times 5, 4 times 4, 8 times 8. And then you need to add up those squared values. If you do that, what do you get? 190. 190. 190. I have a vote for 190. 190. Some head nods. Okay, 190. All right. Now, if you are on what is the left side of the room for me and the right side of the room for you, you are now going to calculate all the numbers for cognitive disorders. You're over here on this side of the room. You're going to do all of the calculations for drug-related conditions. Go. Done with your calculations, raise your hand so I know you're done. Thank you. Put your hand down. Just tell me a few more people to get done. Got it? Got it? Okay, let's start with the easy ones. What's my T, my big T, for cognitive disorders? 45. 45. What's my big T for drug-related conditions? 2025. 20, 20. No, what's my big T for uh, drug-related right. conditions? Moved on, I, I moved over here because we're going back and forth. Everybody can participate. Yes, over here. My big T for drug-related conditions. That's you guys. 50. Huh? 50? Okay. Now, back to my eager team. That's my super quiet team. These are the guys who are like, all right, <laughs> T squared for cognitive disorders. 2025. 20, 2025. 20, All right, for my somewhat shyer team, yes? 
500, yes? Okay. All right, and then T squared over N. 405. T squared over N for you guys. 500. Okay, and sum of X squared for you guys. 419. Huh, 419? And what other team? 510. 510. There we go. Okay, now everybody's got all the numbers. Is everybody clear on where all these numbers came from? Mm -hmm. okay. What we're doing right now is like prep work. Anybody here like to cook? You have to make a complicated dish, and you gotta like. There's lots of stuff you gotta chop up, and measure up, get everything all ready because you're all gonna have to throw it all together at some point. What we're doing right now is all the cleaning and chopping. And then we're going to start mixing stuff together. Okay, so that was cleaning and chopping. Now we're going to move. Everybody's got those numbers written down? Does anyone have any questions about where any of these numbers came from? You're okay with those? If you're not, please let me know. You're good. Okay. Okay, moving on now to the stage where we're going to start combining some of our ingredients. Okay. This is where we begin pooling. Remember when we did independent samples t-test? We had a stage where we pooled things, like we pooled degrees of freedom, we pooled some squares. Remember we did that? Well, this is where we start blending some of, putting things together now and getting values that reflect all of our data, not just individual conditions. So the first value we're going to calculate is G, okay, big G. This symbol stands for grand total, and big G is the sum of T. Okay, so you add your T's together for all three conditions, or all of your conditions if you have more than three conditions. You add your t's together, and that will give you your value for g. So what numbers are we adding together to get g today? 30, 45, and 50. 30, 45, and 50. Okay, so you're adding your t's together to get g. Then you want to calculate big N for your study, and that is the sum of all your little n's. Okay, so we know that our n for each condition here is 5, so that's 5 plus 5 plus 5. So that's what's going to give us our big n. So tell me what you got for g? 125. And what did you get for big n? 15. That's why I like people are saying 15, not 15. Because <laughs> you should be good with 5 plus 5 plus 5. Right. Now, G squared. No tricks. What do you think we're going to do? Square G. Square G. That's right. That's what we're I'm not <laughs> leaving you out. Just square it. So if we square 125, we get a honking huge number, which is? 15,625. 15,625. Jeez. Quick, let's divide that by something and make it smaller. Okay, how about we divide it by big N? So G squared divided by big N is? I, got, I hear one thousand. <laughs> it's like I'm pretty sure it's that big. One thousand. And I'm 41. Okay, I'm 41. Point six seven. Oh, not a round number. Oh, well, that happened. The more conditions you get, the harder it is to get all the numbers to be round numbers. Oh well. You're not afraid of a few decimal places. Okay. Now, we pool things. We're going to end up using these, this value, g squared over n, a bunch. Okay, so all this work was to help us get this value, which we're going to use in several calculations coming up. Next, we need a couple other things. We need to pool a couple other things. First one we need to pool is our t squared over n. So I want you to sum the t squared over n values for all the conditions. Huh? 
1,085 I have a vote for. Same. Yes. Same? We agree? Okay, 1,085. All right, and next, I want you to add up all the sum of x squared. So pool those for me. And because I think it's weird to write sum of sum of x squared, I think that looks really weird. I just call this sum of x squared all. In other words, it's the x squared, all of the x squareds added together. Because otherwise it's just, it's sum, sum of sum of x squared seems really weird. It's awkward. And the Nova's awkward enough. We don't need more awkwardness. Okay, so what do we get if we add up all the sum of x squareds together? 1,119. All right, is everybody with me so far? You know where all those numbers came from? Feeling okay about it? All right. So now, we're gonna start calculating sums of squares and degrees of freedom that we need to do our ANOVA. Okay, so now we're combining more things together. Mixing more ingredients. Okay, here's the table for this. And the way I like to do it is I like to calculate sum of squares first, degrees of freedom next, and then mean square at the end. Now, I'm going to give you a little hack. Okay? A student figured out this a few semesters ago. I saw it on their note card and I thought it was brilliant. Okay? Here's the hack. Okay? In your notes right now, not on this page where you're doing all the math, you know, where you're writing in the answers. But in your notes, I want you to make a duplicate of this table. Okay? So do sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square, between conditions and then conditions total, and leave big spaces, big boxes there with nothing in them. Okay, so write that in your notes. Copy this out. So don't write it on the worksheet. Basically, it's just a three by three, but there's nothing down here in this corner, so you block that out. Okay. So you should have something on your paper now that looks like this. And your worksheet, side by side. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a formula. And in your notes, I want you to write the formula in the appropriate box. Okay, so basically, I'm going to say, for example, to calculate sum of squares between conditions, and you're going to write this in your notes, okay, not on the worksheet, but in the notes, okay, in the boxes you just wrote on your paper. To calculate sum of squares between conditions, the formula is, okay, to calculate sum of squares between conditions, you need the sum of t squared over n minus g squared over big N. So this formula, write this in this box in your notes. And once you've done that, underneath, Go ahead and do that math, because you've got sum of t squared over n. You just calculated it up above, right, right up here in the previous stage. And then subtract g squared over big N, which is two steps up. What was our sum of t squared over n again? 1,085. And our g squared over big N? was 1,041.67, right? These are our values. So if you do 1,085 minus 
1,041.67, what do you get? 43.33. Now on your worksheet, write that number in the blank. Now, I'm going to give you the formula for sum of squares within conditions, okay? So in your notes, where you're writing formulas, note that for this, to get the sum of squares within conditions, this is basically just sum of squares pooled. We're adding up the sum of squares for all of our conditions. So you just go look on the front page where I gave you the sum of squares for each condition. There's a sum of squares for affective disorders, a sum of squares for cognitive disorders, and a sum of squares for drug-related conditions. Just add those three numbers up. And what do you get? 34. I have a vote for 34. I have some more people who agree with 34. Okay. So on your worksheet, write 34, and in your notes, write sum of the sum of the sum of squares in that box, in the corresponding box. So write this in your notes, and that on the worksheet. This is going to be the sum of x squared all minus g squared over big N. Okay. Sum of x squared all from the previous step right here minus g squared over big N. So what was our sum of x squared all? That was 1119 minus g squared over big N, which is 1041.67, right? Okay, and what do I get if I do that? Hmm? 77.33. Okay, so in your notes, in the boxes you drew out, you're going to write this formula in that box, and on your worksheet, you're going to write the actual value. As we go through this, what you're going to find is when you're done, you're going to have a grid for all of these calculations, and there are eight different calculations here, and you're going to have the right formula in each box. This is what you want to put on your note card to remind you about the formulas for doing this part. Because it's hard to keep all these formulas straight, and they have some parts in common, like g squared over big N, and stuff like that. You want to keep all your formulas straight. Putting a grid like this on your note card with the right formula in each box will help you remember which formula you need to fill in that cell. Yes? Will the total always equal the sum of squares between conditions and within conditions? Yep, and that is your backup. Okay. This is your check. It's also the case the sum of squares total is equal to the sum of squares between conditions plus the sum of squares within conditions. Okay, that's also true. But if you do it this way first and then check it with this easier formula and the numbers match, then you can be pretty darn confident that all your math up to that point is right. Because those numbers wouldn't match if you'd screwed something up. And as many calculations as we do in ANOVA, it's always good to have a place you can check that things are going OK. And so I would encourage you, even though it's tempting, you're thinking, I'm on a test, and I just got a few minutes. I want to make sure I get everything done. I'm just going to use the easy formula. Okay. Well, here's the thing, is that if you calculated either one of these wrong, or any of the things that go into either one of those, then you're going to get an answer here, and it's just going to be another wrong answer. 
Whereas if you use this formula to generate sum of squares total, and these numbers don't match, you know something's wrong and you need to go check before you end up with a cascade of mistakes. If you do the harder formula and then you check it with the easier formula and they match, you can go move on. Another check when doing this grid. There are never, if you've done the math correctly, ever any negative numbers in this table. Ever. If you do math in this table and you get a negative number somewhere, something is wrong. Back up and check because you've made a mistake somewhere before. There will never be any negative numbers in this grid. All right. So you should now have your two grids, one that has these three numbers written in and one that has the formulas written in the boxes. Okay. All right, now we're going to do degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom between conditions has the formula k minus 1. So in your notes, right, k minus 1 in the box. And on your worksheet, right, what? What's k minus 1? 2. 2, right, because k is 3. We had to figure that out for f max. Right? k is 3. That's how many conditions we have. Okay. So write 2. The formula for degrees of freedom within conditions is big N minus K. Our big N, we already figured out, is 15. 15. K is 3. So what's our 12. degrees of freedom within conditions? 12. 12. Another backup formula, just to double check. You want to make sure you're doing your degrees of freedom right? There's another formula for this, which is the sum of all the degrees of freedom, or our old favorite, degrees of freedom pooled. Okay, we call it degrees of freedom pooled when we do a t-test. In this case, we call it degrees of freedom within conditions. Okay. So if you add up the degrees of freedom for the individual conditions, <coughs> 4 plus 4 plus 4, you'll also get 12. 12. Okay. So, <coughs> do big N minus K, <coughs> then check it with just adding up the degrees of freedom across for your different conditions, and if they match, you can feel comfortable that th your math is probably going along okay and you haven't made mistakes. If something doesn't work, they don't match, something's wrong, you need to go check. We get over here to degrees of freedom total. The formula for that is big N minus 1. Big N was 15, 15. minus 1, 14. 14. Okay. And, because I know Sarah will notice, because that's what Sarah does, she notices things. What, what's our backup formula? Add the two. That's right. Degrees of freedom between conditions plus degrees of freedom within conditions. Okay? And if that doesn't work, something's wrong. Okay? Alright, so in your notes, you should have the formula in the correct box, and on your worksheet, you should have these numbers. Okay, does anybody have any question at this point where any of these numbers came from? Are we good with all the numbers in the grid right now? Okay. All right, now, we've calculated a bunch of things that are sum of squares and a bunch of things that are degrees of freedom. What do we do with sum of squares and degrees of freedom? What do we calculate with sums of squares and degrees of freedom? Variance. Exactly. We calculate sample variance. 
And this value here, mean square, okay? Mean square is a form of sample variance. Specifically, in this case, it's a form of pooled sample variance that represents the variance for the samples in our study. So we're going to look at the sample variance between conditions, the sample variance within conditions. Okay, that's what mean square is. It's a form of sample variance. So knowing that mean square is a form of sample variance, I want you to guess right now. What is the formula for mean square between conditions? Can you figure it out? Given what you already know. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Sum of squares between conditions divided by degrees of freedom between conditions. And if you need a visual cue to remind you of this, note that you can just divide this number here by the number right below it. It's like I've made you a fraction. Okay. So 43.33 divided by 2 is... Twenty-one point six seven. Yes. Yes. Making a face. Are you okay with twenty-one point six seven? Yeah. Yes. Twenty-one point six six, but if there's five, you round up again. That's right. There's a five, you round up. That's correct. So say it again for me now, because I forgot to answer that question. Twenty-one point six seven. Twenty-one point six seven. Sorry, short-term memory dumped it out before I was ready. Okay. So twenty-one point six seven. And what about mean square within conditions? What do you think we need to do? Well, not exactly the same thing. A little bit different thing. What are we going to use? What goes in our numerator? Sum of squares within. That's right. Sum of squares within conditions. And what about the denominator? Degrees of freedom within conditions. There we go. All right. So if I do that. 34 divided by 12. What do I get? 2.83. Okay. Do I have a confirmation on 2.83? Yep. Yes? All right. So your worksheet should look like this, and the grid in your notes should have the correct formula in each box to solve for each letter. Okay. Now, people go, but what about this box? There is no that box. We don't ever calculate mean square total. We don't use it. We're not going to worry about it. So when I don't put it on the test, don't write it in and do the math and fill in the box. Okay? I have people who just compulsively want to keep doing sum of squares over degrees of freedom. Like, I get it. I can do the next one. It's like, no, stop. Move on. Okay? So if I don't give you a box, don't do the math. Okay? It's easy. All right. So now you've got all your formulas for those boxes. This is a real space saver on your note card for the next test. Because now I can tell you that when you get the test, it's going to be set up just like this with these boxes. And some of the boxes are going to be filled in and some of them are going to be blank. And you're going to have to fill in the boxes that are blank. And if you have your chart set up so that you go, okay, this box is blank, these are the numbers I need, then you just go find them, do your math, write in the value, good to go. Okay. Makes solving this problem on the test much easier. All right, now, having calculated mean square between conditions and mean square within conditions, right, which is the variance between conditions and the variance within conditions, now, finally, we can do the ANOVA. We haven't even done it yet. Because the actual ANOVA is calculating the F ratio. We're going to, because ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. These are the variances we had to get so we could analyze their relationship. Okay? We had to do all that work just to be able to calculate the, the value. And it's the value for ANOVA, the statistic is called F, capital F. And it has been suggested to me by students that it is called this 
because by the time you get this far, the only words that come to mind begin with that letter. Because <laughs> you're just like, we're not done yet? <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> or fascinating! Oh, no, I know, that's totally not the word you think of. All right, so now we can do the actual analysis of variance. We're going to analyze those mean squares. And here's what we do. We're going to calculate our F observed. Okay. And F observed is the mean square between conditions divided by the mean square within conditions. This is our analysis of variance. Our variance between conditions divided by our variance within conditions. And so we're going to take that value we got for mean square between conditions and divide it by mean square within conditions. And what do you get if you do that? 7.66. I have a vote for 7.66. See some nodding? Yes? Okay. 7.66. Great. Now, just another note. Remember I told you. In the table up above, right, with all the sum of squares and degrees of freedom and mean square, you will never ever have a negative value. For that reason, since that's where the numbers that you use to calculate F observed come from. It's also the case that F observed will never, ever be a negative value. F observed is always positive. And if you do the math and you get a negative number, something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. Yes? And you're saying this for any box at the top? Any boxes in the sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square boxes. Yes, none of them. In fact, I can't think of there's no numbers anywhere that are going to be negative in here. Up to what we've done so far. We might get some negative numbers coming up, but up to calculating the F ratio, no. And when we do get negative numbers later on, we take the absolute values and make them positive again. We are all about positivity with that. It's a very positive thing. The nice thing is it means there's no tails. You don't have to mark observed values and critical values plus or minus because they're always plus. If anything ever shows up negative, Freak out. Well, no, don't freak out. That'd be bad. Um, take a deep breath, go back and look and see where something went wrong. Just know, you're not going to get any negative value. Okay, so we've got our F observed at 7.66. Now we've got to look up our critical value. So break out your table and your packet of critical values that I gave you. We're now moving on past T distribution and F max distribution to the third set of critical values there. The F distribution. Okay. Now, this is one is actually several pages long. Okay, so it goes for several pages. On any page, there's lots of these, right? Because you can't have lots of lots of subjects, lots of conditions. Okay, so you have several pages of F distribution table. So get out your, your F distribution table. And keep in mind, when we take the test. Do not get the F max table and the F table confused. They're two different tables. Okay, so make sure you use the right one. F max is only when we're doing homogeneity of variance. F distribution is the one we need for ANOVA. Okay, so if you take a look at the F distribution table, what do you notice about what you need to look up a critical value? What does it say down the left-hand side of the table? What, what are you looking for? Degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom denominator. Okay. And then what's about across the top of the table? Degrees of freedom numerator. Degrees of freedom numerator. You're like, great. We've calculated degrees of freedom for every sample, degrees of freedom between conditions, within conditions, and total. None of them said degrees of freedom numerator or degrees of freedom denominator. What kind of trick are you trying to pull here? And the secret is you have to know which of the degrees of freedom we've already calculated fit the description on that chart. And here's how you figure that out. You take a look at your F ratio. The ratio of between conditions variance and within conditions variance. <coughs> Take a look at that. 
and you say, okay, what kind of variance did I use in the numerator? The answer is the stuff that has the subscript BC between conditions. Okay. That means that degrees of freedom between conditions is your degrees of freedom numerator. And then you look and you see what did you use in the denominator of your F ratio. And you use within conditions. That means that degrees of freedom within conditions is your degrees of freedom denominator. So, our degrees of freedom numerator was 2. And our degrees of freedom denominator was what? 12. So using those two numbers, knowing that we have an alpha of 0.05, what is the value for F critical? 3.88. Hmm? Does it even? This numerator. Mm -hmm. it's like, that's is that correct? Yeah. But which one? Do you mean which one? We should be using the uh, uh, point of five because it wasn't uh, suggested. To get the so it's a light face one. Point of five. Light face one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, hold on a second. Someone has a question. You might have the same question. All right. Someone said, "Where did we? How did we figure that out?" Okay. The chart asks for degrees of freedom numerator and degrees of freedom denominator. The way we figure out what our numerator is, we look to see what kind of variance did we use in the numerator for the F test. Okay. And we use between conditions. That means my degrees of freedom numerator is degrees of freedom between conditions from the chart up above. So two. Two. And degrees of freedom denominator, what I used in the denominator here was within conditions. That means that my degrees of freedom denominator is degrees of freedom within conditions, and that was 12. So using 2 across the top and 12 down the side, knowing that alpha is 0.05, which means you're looking for the number in light face type, okay. what do you find? That, 3.88. Okay. Does everybody know where that number came from? Does anybody need me to do it again? I, if I need to borrow somebody's chart and walk you through it, I'll do it. Everybody's okay with 3.88? If the alpha were 0.01, what would it have been? 6.93. Hmm? Six point nine three. But a point of, yes, question? Um, I'm looking at the chart, but I don't really see that. Can I put it up here on the overhead so I can show somebody? You can see a thing? You can tell I'm old, like, oh, this is. <laughs> And I'm using transparencies. <laughs> All right. So on this chart, it says we need to have degrees of freedom numerator across here and degrees of freedom denominator going down here. Okay. So if we know our degrees of freedom numerator is 2, we go here. And if I know my degrees of freedom denominator is 12, I have to go all the way down, 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 all the way down here till I get to 12. And if I make that bigger, you can see that the top value, which is the one for 0.05, is 3.88. That's what that number is. Does that work? Okay. Thank you very much for asking, and thank you for showing your paper. Okay, so given that our critical value is 3.88 and our observed value is 7.66, are we going to reject or retain the null hypothesis? Reject. Reject. Okay. Our observed value is more extreme than our critical value, so we are going to reject the null hypothesis. That means that, in fact, the alternate hypothesis was supported. There is a significant difference in the length of stay for patients depending on whether they have an affective disorder 
a cognitive disorder, or a drug-related condition. Now we know that that is in fact true, based on these data. That's what the ACT test tells us. Yes? Do we have to um, put like the positive sign in there? You don't have to now because F is always positive. Okay. There is no plus or minus, so it doesn't matter. If you want to, it will not be wrong, but I'm just telling you it doesn't matter at this point because there, there is no such thing as a negative effect. All right, so now we know that first statement is true. So if you wanted to summarize just the ANOVA and say what happened there, you could do it. And you would say there is a significant difference in length of stay depending on whether or not a patient has an affective disorder, a cognitive disorder, or a drug-related condition, period. You've summarized the ANOVA. That's what the ANOVA told us. Now that we know there's a difference, we have to go to the next step. And we have to do a test called a post hoc test. Post hoc means after the fact. We have to do a post hoc test or a planned comparison to find out where the significance is coming from. Which condition or conditions are driving this effect? Which one or which ones are different from the others? Because it's possible that one of the conditions is different from the other two, or that all of the conditions are different from each other. Both of those are possible. We don't know which one yet. So we're going to do a post hoc test to find out the answer to that question. We only have to do this because we got a significant difference with our ANOVA. If you do your analysis of variance and you end up retaining the null hypothesis, you don't have to do the post hoc test. It's not necessary. And there's no point in looking for the source of a difference that doesn't exist. All right. Oh, it's really big. Make it smaller again. Okay. So the post hoc test that we are going to do is a common test called a Tukey test, specifically Tukey's HSD. HSD stands for Honestly Significant Difference. So basically what we're looking for with this test is how big of a difference do we need between any two conditions for them to be significantly different from each other? We know that somewhere among our three conditions, there's a significant difference. Now we have to figure out where it is. And this is the test that's going to let us do that. Now, Tukey's HSD test is a little bit unusual in that it's the only test we've ever done in here where the critical value itself isn't in a table. In fact, we have to do some calculations to get the critical value. And here's what we need to do. To get the critical value, to get what we call HSD critical, the value we're going to put in here. We need to do the following calculation. Q, I put a little tail on it so it doesn't look like a 9. Q times the square root of mean square within conditions over n common. Now Q you've never seen before. Q is a new statistic. You can see it's located right there above H, S, D, critical. And Q doesn't have a name that's easy to remember based on, it's not like quotient or anything like that that would make sense given that the symbol is Q. This, the statistic's name is the studentized range statistic. It doesn't help you at all, did I tell you that? So if you want to see that spelled out, take your table of critical values and flip to the very last page. Look at the very back of your packet. Very last page. And there it is, the studentized range statistic, Q. I guess they ran out of, they used up all the S's and all the T's and everything, so they're just picking other random letters of the alphabet. Okay, Q. All right, now, if you take a look at the Q table, your studentized range statistic table, what information do you need to look up Q? Degree of freedom. Okay. Need to know degrees of freedom, and K. and K. What degrees of freedom do you need? 
Oh gosh. Degrees of freedom for the error term. What the heck's an error term? You're like, well, I don't know. We're hoping you'll tell us. I will tell you. <laughs> it's the same thing as degrees of freedom denominator. So you need to know degrees of freedom denominator and K. Anything else? Alpha. Alpha. So you need to know degrees of freedom, denominator, k, and alpha. We know k is 3. Alpha is 0.05. Degrees of freedom denominator was what? Remember? 12. So knowing that information, What do you find? What is Q? Three point seven seven. We have a vote for three point seven seven. And some other people are nodding their heads saying yes, we think it's also three point seven seven. All right. You are correct. Three point seven seven. All right, so Q is 3.77. Now we can take a look at our formula over here, and we can start substituting in values. Okay. So I know that Q is 3.77, so I'm going to write that there. What was my mean square within conditions again? I have that from the previous one, from up above 2. What was that? 2.83. Huh? 2.83. 2.83, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Mean square within conditions, 2.83. And what is my n common? Five. Five. All right. So now we just got to crank our way through this calculation. So first, what's 2.83 divided by 5? 0.566. 0.566. Which in our language, because we always round to two decimal places, is five seven. Yes. Point five seven. And if I take the square root, yes, question? Will you always have that in common? Like, you cannot do two keys test as your post hoc test if you have different sample sizes. Okay. So it's like F max. If you don't have common sample sizes, you can't do this test. And if you, so if you have different sample sizes, which is possible with independent groups, then you have to do different tests. And for example, in the in Article Two that we're reading, going to read for next week, there are very different sample sizes, and they use a totally different post hoc test called Dummett's test. So yeah, it just depends. But I want you to know what a post hoc test is, and I like this one because it's it's pretty easy to do. So if I take the square root of point five seven, what do I get? 0.75. The square root of 0.57. Are you okay with 0.75? Mm -hmm. The square root of 0.57. Oh, okay. yeah. I don't know what okay. So then I have to take 3.77 times 0.57. What do I get? 2.85. Hmm? 2.83. Now, I had somebody ask me last time. They said, hey, look, HSC critical is the same as mean square within conditions. Is it always like that? Because wouldn't that make life easier? The answer is no, it's not always like that. It's a coincidence. <laughs> so no, you actually have to do this math. Sorry. It just worked out that way. Yes? That's the value we looked up for Q. That's the one we looked up in the table. That's the value for Q we used. We looked it up in the studentized range statistic table. The very last page in your table of critical values. It's on the very, very back. Hold on, don't you lose circulation in your hand. I see you. I'm just trying to make sure. 
she knows how we got that value. Do you want me to bring it up here and put it on the big screen? You see it? Yeah. Okay. Your question. Uh, I got 2.85. Is that a big deal? Okay, so we take 3.77 times 0.57. Seven five. Oh, 0.75. Okay, so 3.77 times 0.75. Oh, yeah, I get to, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I kept getting the other answer. Did you round before you took this square Yeah. What's the white? It's okay. If it's we do fine. it again, are we okay with 3.77 oh, totally times 0.75? Mm-hmm. Is 2.83. Are we okay in the back row too? Yeah. Did it work when you did it again? Yeah. <laughs> you're saying yeah, yeah like yeah. <laughs> you're like I don't know why it was like that. Yes. Did you do the last step one more time? Just from 3.77. Okay. We so that. remember that. Right, let me write the formula up here and we'll walk through each step. So here's our formula for HSD critical. Okay. It's weird because we actually have a formula for the critical value. The thing we look up is Q. That's the constant. Okay. That's what's in the critical value table. The rest of the numbers depend on our data. And you'll notice we can't even calculate this until we've done the whole ANOVA because it takes the whole ANOVA before we know what mean square within conditions is. Everything up to the F text. So first thing we're going to do is substitute in the values for our study. So we look up Q in the table and we get 3.77. You okay with that? Then we look at our previous calculations and we find our mean square within conditions and we substitute in that value. Then we look at our samples and we find out the common sample size. And all of our samples are size 5, so we put 5 here. Then, first step is divide 2.83 by 5. And if I do that and round to two decimal places, I get 0.57. Next step is to take the square root of 0.57. And if I do that, I get 0.75. So then my very last step is to multiply the value I got for Q times the value from that I have left here. So 3.77 by 0.75, and what I get is 2.83, which is coincidentally the same thing as mean square thing conditions, but it won't be that way every time. It just happened to work out that way this time. Purely by action. I think what I was doing at the second to last step, mm -hmm. I was just adding the whole thing into the calculator. Yeah. Don't do that. Step by step by step. Where people made mistakes on the test was sometimes where they skipped a step, where they just they just kept punching numbers in and they would miss something or forget a square root or something like that, and that's where they would make a mistake. So every single step, don't skip steps. Skipping steps, I mean, yes, you're smart, I get that, but when you skip steps.